Right. Well, um, it's very nice to talk to you this evening. It's always um, a little disappointing not to be able to actually see you in the flesh uh, as I'm talking to you. Uh, I'd always much rather come out and um, uh, meet everybody and, and um, talk in the normal way. But uh, in the present circumstances, this is a good second best. So um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Bradgate Park in East Leek, but um, as uh, a, uh, a native of Leicester, as well as somebody who's been lucky enough to work in Leicester archaeology for the last 50 years, um, I know Bradgate extremely well. Um, I'm sure I visited Bradgate before I could walk. Uh, I certainly learned to climb rocks there. Uh, and um, yeah, it, it has a very special meaning for all Leicester and Leicestershire people. Um, while I remember and while this screen is up, I'd just like to um, thank my colleagues, um, Professor Richard Thomas, James Harvey and Jen Browning, who were the real brains behind the, the Bradgate project. I am there as a, a, an honorary visiting fellow, which means really I am um, there to help, uh, but not to run the project, uh, uh, which gives me a, you know, a, a lot of scope. So um, just in case people don't know where Bradgate is, you can see on the screen here, we've got Leicester down at the bottom. We've got uh, East Leek right up at the top of the screen. And Bradgate Park is a few miles to the northwest of Leicester um, in the um, Charmwood Forest, which uh, was a medieval uh, area of grazing and hunting. And um, we know that, that as a park, Bradgate Park goes back to the 1240s when it was enclosed by the, the de Ferrers family, who then through marriage passed it on to the Gray family. And um, it's, um, it's a fabulous bit of, of undeveloped um, wilderness in some ways, um, but one that has been managed in a particular way for the last over 750 years. But 750 years really pales into insignificance when we look at the earliest site that we have found in the park, which is a Paleolithic hunter-gatherer site. Um, if you're familiar with Bradgate Park and the, um, the car park at Newtown Linford, as you walk into the park, you walk in through a gorge. And the view that you have on the screen at the moment shows the view down from the, the Paleolithic site into the gorge. I'm pretty sure that in the Paleolithic, there wasn't a monkey puzzle tree, which you can see um, in the middle of the screen there. But um, I'm fairly sure that the, you know, the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers, um, you know, we're talking somewhere between 13 and 14,000 years ago, right at the end of the Ice Age, um, were using the gorge as part of their hunting strategy. Um, and um, excavations here have produced something in the region, I, I can't remember the exact figure, but something like 6,000 flints from the area that you see there, which is not huge. And you'll see where we are if you know the park, because you can see in the background, the, the ruins of what we have all been brought up to know as Lady Jane Grey's house. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the Paleolithic site, but it is such an unusual one, one of, well, less than a dozen uh, open air sites of, of this period known in the country. Uh, I had to really mention it. Um, this is the, the, the sort of material that was being picked up. It's tools that are uh, spears or, or other projectiles, um, which obviously are being used for hunting. For the, there are piercers and burins and end of blade scrapers, which are used for processing the hides of the animals that are being hunted. The great regret of this site is that the soil was very acidic, so we haven't got the bone that tells us what these Paleolithic hunters were actually 
hunting, which is a bit crucial. But And we don't know, honestly, whether this is a one season 13 or 14,000 years ago, or whether people were coming back to this site year after year. Um, and of course, that is fairly crucial, but you know, something that is very, very difficult to work out. But clearly there was flint napping here because most of the 6,000 or so bits of flint were what we call debitage, which is the, the waste products when you are making and mending tools. And that we're fairly certain that, you know, that sitting up on the end of that, that hill overlooking the gorge in one direction and that flat land looking towards the, uh, the house, um, that you know, when there was nothing else to do, they were using their time to actually get their toolkit sorted out. But um, that is uh, one of the very few bits of prehistoric site. We've got one other site that we think is probably very early Iron Age, probably. But um, we know that there is so much more in Bradgate Park because we've used a technique called LIDAR, which is uh, light detection and ranging. Light like radar is radio detection and ranging. It's a way of um, collecting information from a, a, a plane, which is flying straight and level over the countryside, bouncing light off the surface and collecting the uh, the light coming back again that um, gives you a, a, an amazingly detailed picture of the surface of the ground underneath. I have to say, I don't quite remember this bit of Bradgate Park that we're seeing in the picture. I suspect it may be somewhere behind old John, but uh, I don't know. But that's the results of the, the LIDAR. And you can see... Uh, New Townland Village is in the bottom left-hand corner, and what uh, the the very white bit in the towards the top right-hand corner is Croxton Reservoir, which has taken some of the um, the parks, um, some some bits of the park, um, you know, for to give Leicester a water supply. But you can see that lots of things are showing up here, um, and it gets. Um, things that are only a centimetre or so high and we can see there and you can get really into the detail. Very difficult to make sense of it like this, but we had somebody spend several months poring over this in the greatest detail, looking for the archaeological information. Um, uh, all the archaeological information has been, you know, the obvious archaeological information has been outlined in red there. You can see at, at the top right hand corner, ridge and furrow from the fields of the village of Cropston, which is off on the other side of the reservoir. Bottom left hand corner, ridge and furrow from Newtown Linford. But in the park itself, which you might have expected to really have very little in it, there are sites all over the place. Down at the, uh, the bottom, um, there is a, an enclosure which you've got uh, early Iron Age material from. There are other little rectangular enclosures across there. And uh, the one up in the, the top right hand corner, um, there is Roman material from close to there. So we're fairly certain we've got Roman and prehistoric sites uh, within the park. And um, in the five years that we have, have done, we have really only scratched the surface of the archeology span of Bradgate. I should say that the, the, the very big oval uh, it, um, feature up in the top left hand corner is actually a racetrack and it was the racetrack of the Earl of Stamford who was the head of the the Grey family um, and he uh, if you know Bradgate Park you'll know old John which is a, a folly standing on the top of a very prominent hill well, one of the functions of that was a viewing platform for the Earl to watch his racehorses racing around the bottom of the hill. It was only a practice track, but uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting to see how well it actually shows up in the LIDAR. And I'm told by the rangers in the park that there are furlong markers in the bracken around there. But you know, as I say, lots of... Um, information coming out from this and you can see this line that I'm putting the cursor along 
that is actually the original park boundary. We think the 1240 park boundary, which ran something like that. Um, and one of the, um, the projects, you can see that in diagrammatic form now with old John up at the top, that was not originally in the, the early medieval park. That was only uh, when the park was extended in about 1500, that that area of Charmwood Forest was taken into the park. Um, now, uh, very often in these early parks, there, there is a park lodge um, where the, the keeper of the park would, would live, uh, maybe where the owners, when they were hunting in the park, would stop for lunch, who knows what was happening there. And um, as you can see on this aerial photograph, there is a lovely rectangular enclosure uh, sitting to the west of the ruins of Bradgate House. And we were rather hoping that that would in fact be the, the medieval park lodge. And when we excavated the, the moat, hey presto, there was a stone building of 13th century date sitting on the moat. And we can be fairly certain that what we're looking at here, and this is quite a substantial stone building, um, which had a slate roof. Uh, there are slate quarries at Swidland Woods in one direction to the east of the park and at Grooby to the west, uh, both, uh, or at least some of it, those being owned by the, uh, the family who owned the park. So, you know, uh, and uh, although slates are very difficult to date, we had the ridge tiles that show us that it, in fact, the roof went up there in the mid to late 13th century. So I think we can be fairly confident in saying that it was the, uh, the park lodge that we were looking for. But I want to concentrate tonight on the, the house. Um, now this is the big house that is, is always called Lady Jane Grey's house. Now, as you'll sure you'll remember, Lady Jane Grey was the nine days queen of England uh, after the death of her cousin, uh, Edward the uh, Sixth. Um, she uh, was the Protestant candidate for the throne, but very quickly overthrown by the supporters of Queen Mary, who was uh, Edward the Sixth's uh, sister, half sister, and um, she was pushed off the throne extremely quickly. Um, a, a tragic figure who in the end was executed. Um, Bloody Mary wasn't called Bloody Mary for nothing, but uh, I think she really didn't want to do it. But I'm afraid that uh, Lady Jane Grey's father was a very ambitious and a very foolish man who pushed things too far. Now, the, the image you see there is by Leonard Kniff in 1700. Um, and is the only picture we have, uh, a detailed picture of the park and the house as lived in. And you can see um, this is towards the end of its occupation. Uh, you can see that um, it is surrounded by formal gardens, as you'd expect with a house of this period, with the great hall in the center there and then ranges running back from it. I, I wish he'd gone around to every side and done a drawing from every direction, but unfortunately only from uh, this side. Um, but nonetheless, it does give us a real picture of what this house looked like um, you know, in its pomp. Now, the, the, the next picture we have is from the first map of Bradgate from 1746. And you'll see that at this stage, um, you know, rather than being a completely open park as, as Bradgate Park is today, there are all sorts of boundaries with the Red Deer Park over here. Because there, of course, there are two sorts of deer in Bradgate Park, the Red Deer and the Fallow Deer. And um, at this stage, it looks like the Red Deer were kept separately. They, they both roam, but you don't see the Red Deer, I mean, generally only from a distance because they're fairly shy creatures. 
But you know, this gives us you know, a lot of information about the Bradgate estate in, in the middle of the 18th century. And in the centre is the house. And if we zero in on that, you can see it looks like the house is complete with its big formal garden to the east. Um, but the next picture that we have of the house is from the, uh, the 1790s. Uh, oh, just a little bit more detail, but from the 1790s, and here it is. Um, and you can see it is now a ruin. There is very little more in 1790 um, than there is today in the park. The only roofed building is the chapel, and you can see in the centre there. Um, there are some differences from what we see today, the great gable end has is no longer there and there's a wall that is no longer there but the rest of it looks very very similar uh, and something drastic has happened between 1746 and 1790 um, it would appear that the um, there was certainly a, a change in, in ownership in that the uh, one line of the gray family died out cousins um, inherited who were living at Enville Hall in Staffordshire and also had other houses elsewhere. And really, uh, we believe that the house was just one house too many to keep up and that uh, it was just let go. But it does look like a little bit more than just brick up the windows and walk away. It looks like they may have taken the lead off the roofs. Then, you know, and, and it, it really looks like there is major dilapidation happening in that 45 years between the two pictures that we've just seen. Now, the, the next picture we have is from the 1820s by John Flower, the great Leicester topographical artist. And you can see looking very, very similar, not much change. I'll just draw your attention to the building in uh, below the, the gable end, we will see the archaeological remains of that uh, in a little while. But there is the great gable end. And you can see that John Flower's drawing is almost photographic in its detail with, you can see the, the diaper work, the, you know, the, the Tudor diaper work in, in the gable end. And just how photographic it is, you can see when we have a photograph almost from the same picture from the 1890s, uh, showing up that diaper work even more clearly and the, the down and set Tudor stacks on the top, the two uh, towers uh, there, the middle one a stair tower and the end one a guard road tower. Um, but you see there are stone walls uh, running up to the gable end at either side. Now if you've been to Bradgate Park you'll know that gable is no longer there and it came down in the Great Gale um, in the, uh, the uh, late 1890s, 1895, 1896, I can't remember which. And this is what it looked like immediately afterwards. Um, and obviously you can't let something like that sit there and because there's always the possibility that that will come down next. And you know, the, the next picture we have from the early 20th century shows that that gable end is now being completely demolished. Um, now, up until the late 1920s, the park was still in the ownership of the descendants of the Greys. Um, but in the late 1920s, a man called Charles Benyon, who was the chairman of British United Shoes, a, a shoe machinery company in Leicester, bought the park from the descendants of the Greys and gave it to the people of Leicester and Leicestershire. And from that time, although even earlier, it was a popular picnic spot, but from that time, it has become a real favorite for everybody from Leicester. But one of the interesting things is that the next picture taken from pretty much the same view, you'll notice that there is a difference in that, if we just go back to the last picture, one tower, two towers, now, there are three towers. Um, we hadn't really realized, because nobody has done a, a really detailed analysis of the, the building up to now, 
that that tower actually dates from around 1930. Um, once the, um, you know, this had, was in public ownership, um, they cleared the site because it was a fairly bumpy set with, with bricks that had come down the way the buildings had collapsed. They flattened everything out. They took away a lot of stuff, but they collected the bricks and the stones that they found in the rubble and they used it to rebuild uh, the tower. Now, when you look at this very carefully, you'll see that the vast few courses of brick right at the bottom are right. They are Tudor. So there was a tower there. It's just that the superstructure we see above it is modern. The other towers, this one on the left, the stair turret in the middle and the stair turret over here at the other corner, they are all completely genuinely Tudor. And you see the roofed chapel in the background um, as before. Now, the first reference we have to the park in, in, in a description, um, Apart from a letter from uh, one of the Greys, uh, the Marquis of Grey to Cardinal Wolsey, where he talks about writing from his poor lodge of Bradgate, is John Leyland's description from the 1530s. Now, John Leyland was a librarian working for King Henry VIII. And in the 1530s, he, he was sent to crisscross England looking into monastic libraries. Um, firstly, to, uh, to look for material that might be relevant to the king's great matter, which is the divorce from Catherine of Aragon, and then to earmark manuscripts in the, uh, the libraries that the king might like if, the li if the, those libraries were dispersed when the monasteries were dissolved. And uh, luckily, John Leyland had an ambition to write a history and geography of England. So he kept copious notes of his trips. Uh, he never wrote the book, but the notes survive. And he uh, visited Bradgate in the late 1530s. And he says, uh, at Broadgate is a fair park and a lodge lately builded there by the Lord Thomas Gray, Marquis of Dorset, father to Henry that is now Marquis. So in other words, somewhere in the early 16th century. And that's all he says about the house, a lodge. I worry about this because you know, we are told and we, you know, the, the conventional wisdom about the house is that that great big brick pile um, was built by uh, Thomas Gray in the 15, between 1500 and 1520. Now, it seems to me if John Leyland had seen that, he might have been impressed and mentioned it. But in fact, he is much more impressed by the waterworks and talks about the, um, the, the water brought uh, as a man would judge again the hill. In other words, it looks like it runs uphill. We can tell you it doesn't because we've actually checked the park, the, 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 uh, the aqueduct through the, the park and it has a very gentle slope, but yeah, a very uh, consistent slope between the, uh, in fact, the area where the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer site is going all the way to the house. And the weird thing is that it drives a water mill um, in a mansion in the middle of a deer park, which always strikes me as slightly strange. But if we have a look uh, from Google Earth, you can see uh, the, the, the course of the aqueduct running through into a lake at the back of the house. And then from that lake, you could open sluices and let the water run through to the water mill at the right hand side. Uh, you can see the leet starting off here uh, with the hunter gatherer site up on the hill above, but the water channel, I have to say, I walked past that for years without ever noticing it. But when we look at the 1746 Kidia plan, there indeed is the water mill shown on at the corner of the formal garden. And uh, in the 1840s, 
uh, a drawing of the water mill when it was no longer a mill, but was being lived in by one of the workers in the park. And in fact, it's still there, although a ruin and not something that looks much different from the boundary walls around it. But you can see here we have the mill house itself. Uh, the wheel would have been on this side and the ditch that you see on the right hand side here is the tail race taking the water away back to the River Lynn. So that, as I say, is a slight curiosity and I no, quite know why you want a water mill in the middle of a deer park, but I guess either the, uh, the uh, Marquis was a uh, hobbyist miller or that they just want to um, keep their rights to make their tenants bring their grain to his mill, but slightly strange. But going on to the house itself, uh, here's a plan. Uh, that view that we looked at from Leonard Neff was from this side. So we saw the, the, the main block there uh, with the great hall sitting in the middle with a porch coming from it, a bay window at the other end, um, the tower at the corner there, tower in fact at three of the corners, and you have to wonder if there is actually a tower here, but there is a modern tree, a very big tree in that fourth corner, making it impossible to work out what is going on there. But, um, and then two um, double pile uh, wings running from that block uh, southwards and a courtyard there. But as we've seen, certainly in... Um, the, uh, the, the 1790s, the, 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 there was a wall that ran from that corner downwards and then along the bottom, you know, halfway down the hill. So, um, I have to say, having found out that um, the, that tower uh, was only built in 1930, I was very keen to find early pictures to assure myself that the rest of the building was actually what it appeared to be. And um, there is a set of pictures from the 1890s uh, in the Leicester Record Office. And we see here the Great Hall with um, the, 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 the porches in here somewhere, the, um, the, the Great Bay window there, but not at that point excavated. But you can see now they have taken down at least a metre uh, of soil away from it in 1930-odd. And we now see the porch with lovely pilasters. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a very smart entrance here into the screens passage of the Great Hall that would have stood um, on the other side of this wall with the great windows lighting, particularly this big bay window, lighting the dais at the high end of the hall where the Gray family would have sat in state. Now, if we walk through to this uh, area here and just look through, you'll see uh, the, the, the chapel in the background, which I'll come on to in a moment, but you see now the, uh, the Great Hall, and we will never be able to excavate the, the, the contemporary floor of the Great Hall because it has a cellar underneath it, so that will have long since collapsed. Uh, might be interesting to actually see what those collapsed remains are and whether they were mucked about in 1930 or not, but we do know that uh, you know, a lot of the brickwork was um, reinstated in 1930, so you can't take anything much for granted unless you can find a picture of it uh, before 1930. But here's a, 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 a more stylized picture of the, uh, the plan. Uh, and you can see the Great Hall in the center, as with most medieval um, manor houses, separates the servant space on the, uh, the west side to the family space on the east side. So it's not so much upstairs, downstairs as right hand, left hand. And um, the, uh, the, the kitchens in uh, here and the bakery, we see 
the great kitchen fireplace here, and we can see that's before the collapse of the gable end, so this is 1896. We see it today tidied up, but looking very much the same. We can trust the, you know, this brickwork as being a, a proper idea of, of, of what the, the building looked like. Uh, when we get inside it, you can see there's the great uh, cooking fireplace that we just saw, but there's another great cooking fireplace at right angles to it at the end of the hall there. Through the door and we're into the bakery. That's the way it looks today. And this has been very heavily reconstructed, but luckily there is a picture of, of those bake ovens just after the collapse of the gable end. So this is from the 1890s or all early 1900s, but we can trust the fact there really were bake ovens in that area. And then moving on to the, you know, the family space, uh, the, the great chapel. Now the roof was there in the 1790s, but it's not the original Medi uh, Tudor roof. It, that is a, a, a rebuilt roof. You can see there's a doorway up here, and this is a stair turret that takes you up to that doorway. Um, and we can see, I'm not sure if I put the slide in that gives us a bit more detail, but you can see here uh, in this position, a, uh, a fireplace that once went through there, now into fresh air to the left, and the original floor level of the first floor of the uh, the family space. So these were the the, uh, the main family rooms up at the top. And inside the chapel, there are still Greys in residence. So this is Henry Gray from the early 17th century. Uh, round the other side of the, um, the 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 chapel, you can see again the um, the floor level. Uh, and the regret always in, in archaeology is that in a lot of medieval and Tudor buildings, the important rooms are on the first floor. And clearly we can never excavate those. They are up in the air and are just beyond our ability. But you can see all sorts of blocked openings and what are probably fireplaces and other things in there. At the corner of that is the, the other stair turret. This is called Lady Jane's Tower. And the people claim to have seen the ghost of Lady Jane Grey peering out of the windows of this. Um, but I think probably more a, a feat of imagination than anything else, but uh, because in fact, these are not rooms. This is a stair turret. Uh, and if you go inside, you can see the where the stair has run up along this a sort of spiral stair up through uh, the uh, the tower, and you get up right onto the roof where you would there is the tower, have a lovely view over the formal garden. So as well as being a way of getting onto the first floor of the uh, the house, it's also a prospect tower for looking over the formal gardens to be able to see the intricate plantings that would have been in the parterres uh, that we can see on the right hand side. And you can see the division into four plots within the garden. Now, um, when we first started digging, this was six years ago now, uh, we wanted to, to get an idea of what the archeology span of um, Bradgate would be like, and uh, there was a uh, a building there that we could see on the ground. We could see the terrace for it, so decided to um, excavate that first, just to get a feel for the archaeology. We didn't think this was an important building, but on the other hand, it would give us some clue. And it, you know, for somebody who is used to excavating in towns it comes as quite a shock or, or in uh, fields where farmers have ploughed. Um, in in uh, towns, you can be 20 feet down and still in archaeological deposits. In, in farmers' fields, you know, the top nine or 10 inches will be plough soil. Here, you took the turf off 
and immediately you're into the archaeology. And in places, the archaeology is actually sticking through the turf. Uh, and that comes as quite a shock. Um, but it does mean it, there's an awful lot less hard work. And, it, you know, as we were uh, doing uh, particularly this part of the excavation, uh, taking the material off by hand without machines, it was quite welcome. Uh, you can see we've got a wall there, a uh, little bit more detail. You can see, oh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, let's go back. So you've got a wall here, uh, a drain up the middle of the site. The wall on the other side has been robbed out, but a very heavy metal surface inside. And we think that this may well be for animals or a cart shed or something like that. But it's an ancillary building and we think it's probably uh, of late 16th or 17th century date. That certainly was the material coming out. But of course, the material was mostly coming out from the disturbance to the site. And it may be a bit earlier than that. But um, so that building was in here. And you can actually see in this photograph from the 1950s, very dry year, you may be able to see the foundations of that actually showing up on the aerial photograph. But one of the other, and you can see other buildings, in fact, here, uh, you know, in that very dry summer a couple of years ago, that showed up beautifully. But uh, the other major building that we could see right in the bottom right hand corner here is a building that shows on the 1746 plan. There it is outlined in red, which is, which uh, immediately below this is the word stable, which gives you a clue as to what we're looking at here. And we excavated this um, two or three years ago, um, but uh, the NIF, drawing actually shows us it. Now, when you look at this immediately, you think that this building here is actually part of the main building. But in fact, it's sitting on the other side of the river and is a tall, substantial building with apparently rows of windows on two stories there, um, which I think we shouldn't take too much at face value because one of the things you did is period was to make your stables look as impressive as possible to make your household look posher. Uh, but you can see uh, the main block and a very elaborate again um, porch on this side. Um, and that's the excavation as it first uh, appeared when we've taken the top off. You can see one wall running across there and the other wall just starting to come out um, through here. It's a very long, thin building. And um, here we see the back wall of the stable. You can see the, the other wall coming through here. But um, one of the things we noticed very quickly is that beyond the back wall, the, the soil was um, very, very dark and very, very organic looking. And uh, we soon realized that there were stone um, settings, there were uh, post pads for substantial timbers to stand here and here and here, and then a little wall coming out from there to make a lean to at the back of the building. Now, uh, it's not absolutely certain what's going on, but um, one of the things that you will have in a stable is a lot of horse muck that you need to clear out on a regular basis. And I suspect that they are clearing it out to the back of the building under this lean-to, and then carts would be able to come in and you would then be able to load it up onto carts to take it off uh, yeah, as, as really high quality organic material for your gardens or fields. So, um, so we think that that is the principal purpose of this. But when we excavated uh, slots through those very dark layers, we found a remarkable number of 
clay pipes. This is only a small proportion of the clay pipes that we found. And you can see some of them fairly complete. Um, and some elaborate ones, you can see on the right hand side, uh, some with the maker's initials, fleur de lis down the pipe there, a little hand mark of a maker and a maker's name, John Matz, who was a pipe maker, apparently originally from Brosley um, and then moving to, I can't remember that it was Tamworth or Litchfield, but somewhere a bit closer to home. So um, remarkable number. And we did wonder if as well as being where the horse muck went, this was a designated smoking area at the back of the stables, because if there is a lot of hay inside, you wouldn't want the stable lads actually lighting up actually inside the stable, with, you know, because you wouldn't want to burn it down. In amongst that material, there was also an awful lot of pottery. Um, this is um, one of the, uh, and a lot, a lot of it was imported pottery. Um, you know, on most sites of this period, the the material is almost always completely or predominantly of local manufacture. But here, this is German. This, this is what we call a Bellamine, what they uh, call uh, a Bartmann Krieg, a, a beardy man jug in German. And there were a lot of these coming out. This is one that just pulled out of the ground as we see it here. But we also got the local material from places like Ticknell and other major sites. And there was a lot of material coming out from this, um, including glass vessels, uh, these manganese wares, uh, middle and yellow and, and Cistercian and middle and black ware. So the, the sort of stuff you expect to see on 16th and 17th century sites. Uh, here's uh, an aerial shot of, of the site that, that I took on, on the last day of excavation. Um, and you can see, the long, thin uh, building with, at this point, the porch that we could see on the NIF uh, drawing, uh, with then to one side of it uh, a little, well, we think it's a stair to take you up onto the first floor of the, the porch. Uh, and then the, build, the, the walls carry on and then turn back. And originally it was a plain rectangle with the porch in the front. They then put a little extension on the back of it to make it into the L shape, capital L shape, that we see on the, um, the uh, Kidia plan. And there is the porch, not fully excavated at this point, but one wall on this side, one wall on that side and a great cobbled road running all the way from the house right up to the door of the porch. Uh, the inside, um, the, the floors were not well preserved. There were some floors, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I say this we think is the stair and this fairly roughly paved area here in brick, we think is the cupboard under the stairs. And like most cupboards under the stairs, pretty ramshackle. But there, this fabulous block of slate here is the step that takes you into that uh, stair that you wind up onto the first floor of the building. Now, um, up uh, beyond, as you can see, it's quite a narrow building. Oh, uh, within the building, there were tiny little patches of the floor, enough to show us that it was a, a brick floor uh, laid in herringbone fashion. So the bricks at an angle to one another. Um, but we think that most of this floor was actually lifted and recycled. Uh, there we see it from uh, uh, another angle. You can see at, at the, the far end of the site, there is a heavily metalled area, which may be an approach road to uh, the house and running up the, uh, the building, a line of post holes. So every meter and a half or a little bit more was a post hole. There they are on the ground and you can see 
one of the things that happened is when they pulled the posts out, bits of the brick floor fell in. So uh, although this was the terribly dry summer two or three years ago, um, which meant finding post holes was not easy, uh, the fact that um, the, there were bricks sticking out gave you a chance to find the post holes a lot easier. And what we think these are, are the posts at the front of the stalls for each of the horses up against the back wall of the stable. And here's the plan and you can see there are something like 25 or 26 stalls. What this little extension at the back is, we don't know. Maybe it's a tack room or something like that that's been uh, you know, tacked onto the back. <laughs> and um, the other thing to um, draw your attention to is the strange mound here uh, up in the top left hand corner which uh, was red clay uh, built up against the wall of the stable. And when, uh, there it is, you can see, revetted very roughly with stones. I don't think this can have been there when this was a very smart stable block. It looks rough and ready. But the red clay at the back is sealing a deposit of horse bones. And um, you know, these are uh, big post medieval horses. Uh, Professor Thomas, uh, who was the academic director of the excavation is a bone expert. So he tells me that these must be late 16th, 17th, 18th century horses, not anything from the early history of the site. And there, you know, a huge number of leg bones, but just the odd skull as well there. And this is a, is a mystery, why there are the, all these bones uh, piled up against the wall and then covered with red clay. We think that probably this is from a very late stage in the history of the building when it stopped being the stables and had become uh, the kennels as we're told in a documentary reference and you know the hounds used in the hunting in the park were kept there and maybe these are the horses that have been um, you know, got past their sell-by date and fed to the dogs and the bones are just piled up outside. Rather gruesome but um, unusual. And one of the things we didn't realise to start with, although we were finding some 19th century pottery, I rather assumed in my head that we were looking at picnics in the park. But in fact, one of our friends, uh, David Ramsey, who's done an awful lot of work on the park, uh, came up with a picture from the 1840s, which shows the building still in one piece in the 1840s. And we can now tell that the building was demolished in about 1855, at the time that a new Bradgate was built a couple of miles away to the west by Harry Gray, the seventh Earl. Um, it is an extravagant building with, with tens of bedrooms. Uh, he was an extravagant man. He wanted to come back to Leicester for the hunting, uh, built a big new stable block. And I wonder if, the materials from our stables at the old Bradgood are actually still incorporated in the stable block that still stands, although in ruins, at the new Bradgood. The house itself didn't last beyond the 1920s and was demolished at that stage. But now just for the, uh, the end here, I want to do a whistle stop tour around our excavations of the house itself, because one of the things that we went into this excavation knowing that we were looking at Lady Jane Grey's house. Um, we all took that as a given that this was built between 1500 and 1520, but we'll see what the evidence suggests. So we have excavated uh, relatively small excavations. This is a scheduled ancient monument. We're not allowed by Historic England to uh, excavate too much. We have to preserve the below ground archaeology, but where things have been disturbed in the past, we are allowed to you know, dig those out and have a look at what is going on. And you can see there are 
uh, five areas of excavation, we actually did a little bit more uh, up in this block running this way. And, and that was interesting because that block, unlike everything else, which is built of brick, that block is made of stone. Yeah, um, and it looked different. And we did wonder whether we might be looking at something earlier that had been incorporated. But I'll take you around these uh, one by one. Um, we start, sorry, I forgot to show you where we're starting. We're starting at the front of the house here. Um, in uh, an area that was excavated in 1930 and pretty much completely dug out. So there wasn't an awful lot to left for us. Uh, there was a big stone circular feature here. Nothing that had been completely dug out in, in 1930. There was nothing left for us to give us any clue as to what that was for. Uh, at the back, you'll see the brick remains of a building. And if you remember uh, on the John Flower drawing, I pointed out that building sitting just in front of the, the house. This is it. We can see its footings. Um, they had taken the, uh, you can see as we excavate, you can see a lovely brick patio at the back of the house running up to the remains of the, um, the, 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 the big house at the back. So this is a little cottage for an estate worker but they had taken right down to the bedrock. But interestingly, amongst the bedrock were flint tools. So we have sitting under the house, another prehistoric hunter gatherer site. This one is Mesolithic. So this is only something like 8,000 years ago. Um, although we did also a little bit further over in one of our test pits find more Paleolithic material of the same date as the hunter-gatherer site up next to the gorge. So that was a little bonus. Um, we then um, did a little excavation in the kitchen just to see what the preservation was like. Um, we remember the two great cooking hearths and you can see where we have laid out our trench to look at both hearths hearths but not take away the full extent and um, what we found was um, disappointing I did this excavation and it was very disappointing because over the whole area was the remains of a mortar floor and we are not supposed to go through floor levels um, to any great extent um, you can see in, in the best preserved bits of mortar, a, a sort of rectilinearity in, in it, suggesting that there were flagstones sitting on there. And we're not looking at the floor itself, but the, the bedding for a stone floor. And in the, uh, the second cooking hearth, we got a succession of half surfaces with different sorts of material, but all heavily burned. And you can imagine that sitting in this end of this hearth was a, a, a poor expendable child turning a great spit to spit roast the venison from the park or whatever else they were eating there. But uh, as I say, because we couldn't go through these fragmentary floor levels, it was very disappointing. We got very little evidence from it. We were immediately, uh, yeah, when we opened this up, we was immediately foxed by what this group of stones was until we realized there was a drain running underneath it. And you might be able to see just on the, this side of the, the, uh, the, the viewer side of the, um, the, the, the rather rough stones, uh, a big slate block. And most of the drain was covered in these big slate blocks. Uh, as you see, very young people excavating because these are all students from the University of Leicester who are learning how to do their excavations. That what the, the prime purpose of the excavation is a teaching one. Um, we re once we realised that this was a rough um, patch across the top of the drain, we retreated swiftly from it, moved back, removed a slab further up that we could put back securely, lifted that slab, you can see it just on the side there, out, 
and got a view down into the drain. You can see it's a brick lined drain. There's a shot along it and you can see um, silt at the bottom. We were really hopeful that that would have good environmental evidence in that would tell us about what people were eating. And, um, but in fact, um, the, from the sample we got, we found plastic gloves. Uh, and we realized that this drain is still open at the end and water is wa washing through it. So there was nothing left to find. Uh, the second area we excavated was just a, a very small sticky out bit, as we technically call it, on the east side of the building. You can see it on the NIF drawing, no door in it, so not a porch. Windows, first floor and ground floor. Um, and here it is. Uh, as you can see, the way they reconstructed it in 1930 is not the shape that it originally was. You can see the original wall foundations on either side. But the fact that it was just full of drains um, suggests that what we're looking at here is a guardrail. That we're looking at, at the ensuite for the um, you know, the upper story of this, uh, and that the drains would be taking away the material down to the stream. And there's the top taken off there, and you can see a whole series of drains running through this. Um, two little excavations out the back in this stone block that I mentioned. Um, right at the back of it, we, we got a very heavy stone setting for something in the corner um, with a partition wall, a wooden partition wall that the plaster on either side of it was still there. What they were doing there, we have yet to work out. But uh, on the other side of the partition, a cobbled floor. But because we can't take those away, we're not really sure what date we are looking at. And as you can see, these sit remarkably just under the turf. Um, halfway down, we excavated at one of the fireplaces. And you can see that there's several phases. And it looks like the fireplace has been actually cut into this wall in a second phase, that it was stone to start with. And the brick fireplace has been punched into the wall. Um, getting into the, the really sort of nitty gritty of the site, um, excavations here, and we excavated here because um, on dry summers, you could see a parch mark running in, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, in line with this wall, turning and then running back in line with that wall. So it looked like the end of this block had actually been cut by this wall. And we wanted to actually, um, we wanted that to actually uh, show that that was the case. And as you can see, um, the, these are, the, this is um, my two uh, colleagues, Jen Browning and James Harvey, the directors of the excavation. And you can see the wall coming through here and then turning back in line with these stone walls on the other side. And you can see Jen marching very purposefully for the uh, opening there. And uh, if she stood in the doorway and looked, you can see a floor running across and then very rough material here that is not a proper floor. Um, either the floor was at a much higher level and we've lost it, or it's at a much lower level. And I suspect that that is the case and that we may need at some stage to go back and do more excavation. But um, in a subsequent season, um, the last season on the site, we, um, we came back and excavated more, that, but this is uh, the first go at that. And you can see the end of the building showing through here over on this side. Oh, and from that, we were getting window glass and a very, very smart Venetian glass vessel suggesting high status use. Not surprisingly, we're in the family space of the Gray family. Um, on the end was a brick plinth, which looks like a chimney base, but, uh, but no chimney, but no hearth here, suggesting we're looking at a two story building with the heart, with the, um, you know, the, fireplaces up above. But um, as this was extended, the wall that we thought was just going to turn back at a right angle 
stubbornly carried on. And then the wall that we thought was going to stop at the corner stubbornly carried on. So we had to come back to this for further excavations. You can see now we can see that wall is running on and is cut by one of the, the, the walls of the main block of the building showing that this is a much earlier phase. The other wall gets robbed out but runs on uh, as well and we can now see that chimney base uh, partly brick, partly stone, now showing up very clearly. And the area in here was just rubble, mostly brick rubble that had just been dropped into an open space. And as it turned out, on the last day of the excavation, uh, Jen Browning, who was excavating this, got to the floor. And you can see a brick floor, and we've got a cellar here. Um, with um, that all of this predates the standing building that we have always called Lady Jane Grey's house. But in the front, we're also excavating. Now, as you can see on this plan, there is a, 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 a building that is at a slight angle to everything else that just doesn't make sense in terms of the, the plan of the house. And you can see why they were able to show it, because it was just sticking through the grass. And that's because they have stripped off in 1930-odd all of the destruction deposits of this house. So they've gone down to something hard and then stopped. Luckily, they stopped when they hit the walls and not when they hit the floors here. So we had something to play with. Um, as we excavate, you can see that the floors are a very solid stone floor inside this building with weirdly a drain bringing water in to run over that floor. As we excavate it further, you can now see uh, the, uh, the, the full extent of this building with a, a, a paved area beyond it, the, the floor inside. Uh, and drains all over the place. But you'll see that this wall, it looks a little bit odd. Uh, and you can see that it's divided with a partition wall uh, up the middle into an area with a red clay floor on one side and a stone floor uh, on the other. There we see it a little bit more clearly. But out beyond that building, there is again a uh, something butted up to it, which we think is probably a chimney base, possibly. Uh, and that stone butted up onto stone and then butted up against that stone wall is a brick wall. A lot of complexity here. Now, coming off the, uh, the floor was a, um, a coin and uh, uh, other material coming off that gives us a date for when that building is going out of use. And uh, rookie error here, I actually photographed that inside the plastic bag. But just to give you an idea of what you are looking at there, it's a coin of Henry VIII and not in his prime. It's fat old Henry from the 1530s, suggesting that this building was still there with material building up on its floors in the 1530s, um, which causes some problems as it seems to be an earlier phase than the brick buildings, which we have always called Lady Jane Grey's house. Doesn't mean it couldn't be, but it begins to look a little unlikely. Um, here's the partition between the uh, red clay floor and the uh, stone floor. And you can see the slot for a timber partition, but also earlier medieval floor tiles, which we still can't quite explain, although we believe that they have probably been won from the monastery of Ulverscroft that was belonged to the Grey family and was being dismantled in the 1530s, 1540s. But if we see the, um, that, uh, we can see the, uh, there's the red clay floor, the, the chimney base or whatever that is, butted up against it, and then the brick wall butting up against that. But you'll see there's another brick wall butting up against that. There are phase after phase here. And then a floor in here, which we didn't understand in these excavations. Um, and you can see drains, another drain, bringing water 
onto the floor of this building. The other one was through here. And when you look very carefully, you can see that there is a shallow channel to take the water across the floor. So, um, and two things to say here. Firstly, we've got a lead water pipe showing that water was being piped into the building at this stage. And then that this brick wall is cut by the stair turret of the chapel. And that that seems to be an integral part of the chapel building, suggesting that the chapel is later than all of this, which um, means that we've got two buildings superimposed on one another, not things that have been there at the same time. And here's uh, a, a vertical view. In fact, this is photogrammetry. And you can see all of that stuff running on, but also that this wall doesn't stop here where we originally thought there was another wall, it runs on. Um, so in the last phase of the excavation, we excavated in on the right hand side and the left hand side to, uh, to find out what was going on. And you can see here, uh, the magic of photogrammetry, we've been able to put seven, you know, two seasons or th three seasons of excavations um, together. And you can see this wall just keeps running and it went right across the whole area we excavated and ran out the other side. So this is a big complex with another wall running off at right angles, a drain cutting across it. On, on the other side, we have a, uh, a kitchen hearth here, rubbish pits, a guard robe, and a stair turret in the corner to get you onto the first floor of this building that we were guessing existed. There's the guard robe, there's the stair turret, and there is the cooking hearth. Um, you know, if we're looking for somewhere that Lady Jane Grey toasted her toes on a cold day, this is most likely to be it, I would think, but we can't tell for certain. But you, there you can see it um, with a bread oven on either side of the main cooking hearth. Uh, a big rubbish pit sitting in front of the, of the cooking hearth with a fabulous amount of animal bone and pottery in it that appears to be somewhere in the early 16th century with almost complete parts, bits of um, imported Dutch material. And um, yeah, this, th that's the big rubbish pit there. And this runs on under the chapel uh, wall as far as we can see. So this is something earlier. Uh, there's that drain that I mentioned cutting across this that seems to be from a late phase. There's the wall that runs under it. That is the end wall of that building just carrying on um, with a right angle wall that I showed you on the vertical with some fabulous finds coming out from it. A candle holder, uh, a, a fabulous Adam and Eve on a big button and more floor tiles with, with drains running around the outside of the building. So there it is dropped onto the plan of the house. And you can see that you know, this building up here uh, with the stone building up here running down in line with it seems to be all of a different phase to the big brick building. And um, it's, yeah, clearly there are, yeah, there are, there were two Bradgate houses. You know, the one with the stone footings and the brick building you know, that was built on top of it later on. And there is, you know, clearly they could not have existed at the same time. So what do we know? Well, from the excavations, we found no material that seems to be earlier than 1500. So that story that something was built between 1500 and 1520 seems to be right. We believe that is probably the stone building we're looking at. I and mean, it's there for a long time. And the different phases of building suggest that it was extended and probably in use at least into the 1530s, if not the 1540s or later. And you know, they predate the ruined standing building that we see. So who is likely to have built, built it? Well, there are two possibilities. One is that it's Lady Jane Grey's father. And in fact, Lady Jane Grey was living effectively in a building site at Bradgate. 
uh, he became Duke of Suffolk in, in you yeah, uh, know, 1550 odd, um, and, you know, became much richer and grander uh, and was executed in 1554. So uh, along with Lady Jane Grey. So uh, he didn't have long after he became Duke to build it. And, and yeah, we don't know. But uh, the other possibility is that the brick house is built uh, much later in the late 16th century. Now Bradgate was seized by the crown because Henry Grey was a traitor. And uh, although it was leased back to the family, it was not given back to them fully until the late 16th century. And it may be at that stage or immediately afterwards that the, the later Henry Grey, who became Baron Grey of Gruby in 1603, within weeks of Elizabeth I dying, he became Baron Grey. Up to that point, he was Sir Henry Grey. Um, Elizabeth I bore grudges and, of course, Lady Jane Grey not only would have stopped Mary becoming queen, she would have stopped Elizabeth becoming queen and she didn't like it. So it's only when James came to the throne that he became a baron. Um, now, uh, we've, late on, we found a new document um, in the National Archives. And this, not dated, but apparently from the 1550s, and it says the house of Bradgate is all of brick, new built by the late Duke of Suffolk, and in very good repair, saving that a good part of the floor of the hall is fallen down by reason the joists were so slender, and the boards which need mending in diverse places. Now, does that suggest that this may have been the building of the brick house, or are we looking at the brick extensions? Um, you know, although it says new built, it, you know, it doesn't mean that it's entirely rebuilt. And I can't give you a definitive answer. We still have to look at all the material that we've excavated and date the deposit, which will give us much better clues. We have to look closer at the historical sources. Mm. Everybody has copied everybody else up to now. And there is a conventional story that has remained the story. We need to go back and really look harder. We need a proper survey by proper building archaeologists of the ruined buildings. And then we might have a definitive answer as to whether this is Lady Jane Grey's house or this is Lady Jane Grey's house. And until we do that, we will not know the answer. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully within the next couple of years, as we do all of that analysis and we are able to finish doing that, we should be able to come to a definitive conclusion. But I have to say we have not done it yet. So thank you very much. I've gone on a little bit longer than I intended to, but I hope you found that interesting. <laughs>